welcome to the Picture This Photography Podcast, where we talk about all things photography. And today we're going to be talking about five more lies that camera manufacturers tell you. So we had another video called Five Lies Camera Manufacturers Tell You. This is five more. We have more stuff to talk about. Yeah, we had a hard time cutting it down to just five last time. And some of the five that we saved for this time are actually bigger. You know what, Tony? This world is a lie factory. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really upsetting. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. They have beautiful, award-winning designer templates, an all-in-one platform, and award-winning 24-7 customer support. That's right. They want a customer support award. I don't even know how that happens. But you can get your very own free trial of Squarespace today for 14 days, no credit card needed. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea, use the coupon code Chelsea, and probably don't use the coupon code Tony since I have made this a competition without him knowing. Either way, you get 10% off. Yeah, I mean, you benefit. Okay. This one has been really irritating to us personally as of lately. <laughs> Yes. So forgive us while we get into our own heads for a little Just bit. let us go there, because we need to. It's going to be cathartic. Everyone is saying they have the ultimate vlogging camera. And I don't, I don't see that, quite <laughs> frankly. No, and I think <laughs> people who vlog and film themselves all the time, we, every new camera that comes out is the ultimate one. And yeah. it's always that they have added one new feature that vloggers want to their screen. camera. Just yeah, a flip screen. It's a flip screen. Sometimes not even a flip screen. And then they just declare it the ultimate vlogging camera and you're like, um, but it doesn't have a mic jack and I kind of like people like to hear me when I vlog. I mean they don't like to, but I need to be heard. <laughs> I also believe them every single time. I'm extremely optimistic. So yeah. I'm like, what? Especially when it's small. And I just fantasize that this is possible that there's this tiny vlogging camera that has everything I need. Uh, but so far, that has not been the case. Here, here's a good example. When the GoPro 7 came out, Casey Neistat interviewed Nick Woodman, and he talked about how the GoPro 7 was going to be this fantastic vlogging thing. And Nick Woodman, the CEO of GoPro, could not understand why vloggers were using such big camera rigs. <laughs> Yeah, he said something like, I don't get it. Why use that big rig when you can use this tiny little GoPro? And I think something that I'm realizing is that a lot of people thinking about having vlogging cameras have not tried vlogging because I think you have to do something to understand the needs of the people you're appealing to. Yeah, you know, one thing that the GoPro was missing, one thing vloggers might want. What? A screen so they can see themselves. Like, if you're filming yourself, you might want to know where you are in the frame, right? That can be useful. See, you know what's interesting? It's absolutely useful. I've heard people talk about that feature as though it's a vanity thing. Like, we need to look at ourselves to see if we look good. It's not that. You have to see if you're in focus and you're composing the shot. It's moving photography and you're taking a self-portrait at all times. So you have to have good lighting. You have to be in focus, and the shot has to be composed properly. It's not a vanity thing. You have to see yourself. You need the screen. It also it, it had a mic jack, but you had to use an adapter, and it didn't have any place to mount your microphone. Like, almost all vloggers use an external mic because the sound is garbage on every in internal mic. Yeah, why is that? So you would have to then need to add some extra bracket to mount the microphone to and get an adapter and have this extra cable, and it... Uh, didn't have a headphone jack, which not every vlogger needs, but sometimes you want to listen back just to make sure the sound didn't get screwed up, like wind wasn't going into the mic so that you can immediately re-record it instead of finding out later. And there's a long list of reasons. The GoPro is a good B-roll camera, but not a good main vlogging camera. But it's not like it's just the GoPro. Like the Sony RX0 Mark II just came out, and they were hyping it as a great vlogging camera because they actually put a flip screen on it. Yeah, and like, that's, that's a good step in the right direction. That's a good step. And it has a proper mic jack on it. That's great. But it it doesn't have a place to mount your microphone, and the lens would never uh, cast anything in the background out of focus, which is useful sometimes. But it also has this one fatal flaw. It doesn't do continuous autofocus. So every vlogging review I saw of that camera featured lots of footage of the main subject out of focus. Because... It would start, it would focus when you started recording. And that means you pull the camera a little bit closer to yourself and you hit the record button and then you hold it at arm's length again. So you would just 
immediately be out of focus. So you'd have to hold it as far away as you needed it and then press record and then yeah. but then not change that distance which is can be difficult if you're walking around. Yeah, and if you're vlogging, you often flip the camera around to show something else. You turn it so you can focus on something in the background. Or, yeah, your arm moves closer. Sometimes you move the camera in and out just to make it interesting, and you need something that tracks your like, Okay, currently there is no ultimate vlogging camera, but companies keep promising it. Let's move on. Talk about my favorite subject, <laughs> focal length and f-stop. I love when you, you get so hyped up about this. Oh my you don't God. talk about it enough, quite frankly. Let's start with the iPhone. S cameras are such a big deal that smartphones, when there's a new one, they primarily market the camera. That's one of the lead things that they market. And with the latest iPhone, when they launched it, they talked over and over again about the f1.8 aperture on the wide angle lens. Now, when you think f1.8, that immediately conjures the image of like a proper lens on a proper camera, right? Yeah, like shallow depth of field, letting in a ton of light in a low light situation. That sounds amazing. And this has that f1.8 lens, so you might think, I assume that it's going to give me results like the f1.8 lens that's on my real camera. Couldn't be further from the truth. If if you actually put this into 35 <laughs> millimeter equivalent terms, it's on, on the iPhone and most smartphones, it's around f13. It's completely different because you cannot isolate the f-stop from the physical focal length. Like literally, if you look at the math, the focal length is part of the formula for the f-stop. If you just state the f-stop and not the focal length, you have no meaningful information about the results that the camera and the lens are going to produce. You just can't admit tell. it, this is the crop factor example of your dreams. <laughs> for those of you exclusively listening, Tony's posture has drastically changed and he is hyped up. Yeah, I'm super pumped. <laughs> no, I just wish they wouldn't market using these commonly known f-stops like f1.8 because it literally just tells you nothing. It is only there to mislead people into thinking that it produces results like a full-size camera would. So it's not... The thing is, we call this the lies in quotes because that's not technically a lie. Technically, they can call it f1.8, but when you're using it, that's not how it ends up. Yeah, I, you're right. It's physically F1.8, but to market it like this is misleading. To separate it out and to make people think that it has something meaningful, it, there's just it's not going to give them the results that they expect. But we, it's not just Apple. It's real like point and shoot cameras or fixed lens cameras too, like this Lumix FC 300, which advertises a 25 to 600 millimeter lens with an f2.8 aperture. Can you imagine a 600 millimeter lens with an f2.8 aperture? How big would that be? Because yeah. I have a 600 millimeter f4, and it's about two and a half feet long and weighs about five pounds. So it would be about twice as big because it would have to gather twice as much light, right? It would be it would be amazing. This is something I want: <laughs> is a 6, 25 to 600 millimeter f2.8. But unfortunately, it doesn't exist. If you actually put both the focal length and the aperture into 35 millimeter terms, then it's a 25 to 600 F16. Yeah, 600 millimeter F16. Now, physically, it is F28, but physically, it's a 5 to 115 millimeter F28. And I would just argue that you could say 5 to 115 F28 or 25 to 600 F16. Both are useful pieces of information, but when you mismatch the 35 millimeter equivalent focal length with the physical aperture, then you're overstating the capabilities of it because it, it does not behave like a 600 f2.8. 5 to 115 2.8 still sounds impressive. Exactly. Like these cameras can be impressive. You don't necessarily need to overstate them. They are good for what they are. I'm not saying they're universally bad, but let's not mislead people. I think that these camera manufacturers could, could learn some Chelsea tricks. Uh -huh. I like to tell people that I'm older than I am, and then they feel better about me. If they made it sound worse than it was, people might feel a little impressed. That's some good marketing tips from Chelsea. Set low, low expectations. If they ever, if you guys want to consult with me, you can call me anytime. I have great advice. Yeah, the next time Tim Cook launches an iPhone, I know he's going to be up there and be like, you know what, this is not very good. 
<laughs> guys, it kind of sucks. It is we very really old. This, this is 60 years old. <laughs> <laughs> After the break, we're going to be talking about influencers, influencer marketing, and how manufacturers have some influence on their reviews. But first, let's talk about someone that's really influenced me. That's Squarespace. Whether you want a domain or a website or a beautiful photography portfolio, you can make that happen with Squarespace. I have one, it's so easy to make. If you can drag and drop, you can make your very own Squarespace website. Tony has three, one Squarespace gave to him for free and two he bought because he was that impressed. You can get your very own free Squarespace website today. 14 days, no credit card needed. You just gotta try it. And if you decide to buy it, you can go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. You can also use the coupon code Tony, um, but I don't recommend that. <laughs> I just don't, okay? <laughs> uh, thanks Squarespace. Let's talk about, this bugs me personally, there's this amazing technology where you will take a picture and the camera will move the sensor by a pixel or half a pixel, and then it takes four or eight pictures and stacks them together. And it can produce much better, cleaner, sharper images. It's great. But there's this big problem where if there's any movement, it moves between those two frames and then it just screws everything up and the whole picture is shot. So movement like maybe in water or moving swaying trees or grasses or people moving. Yeah, exactly. And camera companies, this is like a major limitation because there's almost always something moving in the world. I've like noticed. in every landscape photo, there's yes. stuff moving. So camera companies want to overcome that limitation and they keep telling us that they've developed some uh, machine learning AI trick that figures out everything that was moving and automatically fixes it for you. Yeah. We've tested this from a bunch of different cameras and every single time it's completely useless. <laughs> like the Pentax uh, K1 had this and I tried to use it for landscape photography and just took a picture with water in it. And the water turned green and magenta. It's beautiful. <laughs> it actually ended up kind of cool, but it is not <laughs> the way it looked in the real world. And that's not a trait that you look for in cameras. <laughs> is adding in random weird <laughs> colors. And then we tested it with the Olympus OM-1X, a great camera, but with this particular feature, it made waves just look like absolutely insane, like the matrix was breaking down or something and suddenly you could see into the universe that was being projected onto your retinas. Tony, that's a dramatic interpretation of what <laughs> happened and you know it. Okay, the waves got a little screwy, <laughs> but still, <laughs> It's, it's, they advertise it for landscapes and you can only use the feature for landscapes if your landscapes do not include vegetation or water. Maybe vegetation without wind? I, in my experience, I've never had it work. You end up getting some leaves that end up super screwy and like that defeats the whole purpose. You would only use the tech, the tech if you wanted it to be sharper than ever. Yeah, that's really true. Once you, because you, if you want to use that tech, you're a pixel peeper. Yeah. And if you start your pixel peeping journey and you peep upon some problems, you're going to be sad. So sad that you didn't keep going with the alliteration. I know. It's really real, beautiful. Like, real role I was like there. really impressed. <laughs> Digital versus optical zoom. Dang, I remember those old commercials where they'd just say your camera would zoom forever. And yeah. now people kind of have the same expectations for their smartphones. You have the digital zoom and things just gradually break down and look worse and worse as you zoom in. It's not practical. No, this was like a bigger deal in the 90s, I think. Especially yep. the first digital cameras would offer a thousand X yeah. Zoom and I remember I like literally bought a, a my first video camera and I was a wildlife photographer and I wanted to like get into video and I would zoom in because I had some ridiculous X number of 10,000 X zoom <laughs> but like the first 10 X was optical and then after that it was digital which just means it's it's just cropping it yeah so you'd zoom in and it would just be it would be both blurry and shaky <laughs> like oh this is completely useless i just spent a thousand dollars on a brick this yeah. is not any like, good observe this cluster of brown pixels it is a moose <laughs> I'm Thank God we don't really measure zooms in times anymore. It was always a hundred times. Like, what does that mean? Times of what? It's exciting. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like a really <laughs> big deal, right? 
Okay, this is the big one, and I know we're both kind of even dreading bringing up the topic because it's <gasps> uncomfortable. We thought about just leaving this one out because I feel like if we put suspicion in people's minds, they always just go crazy with it. So let's, all right, let's be careful about this one, Tony. Our number one is this influencer loves it. Let's separate it from the camera community a little. Okay. Bit. Because part of this is we're talking about people that we know and it was like firsthand experiences that we've had. But we earlier brought up the example of Breaking Bad, like a show, great show. And then in the middle of season something, they suddenly switch to, I think, a Dodge Charger. Yeah, Walt gets a car. <laughs> he has to explain it. And then there's this whole montage of him like showing off the capabilities of the car. That's fine. But you have to be aware that these things happen everywhere. So this is why we're hesitant. We're not saying, like, this is just camera reviewers or this is just camera companies. This is just how products work. They work their way into your content. Like today, Squarespace, which we are telling you is sponsoring this show. One problem is that sometimes influencers will be holding up their favorite camera. And what they're not telling you is also this camera is one that someone gave me and they're making me say this right now. So this is something that we want you to be aware of. This is something I tell my own daughter, she's 15, and I tell her when you're on Instagram and someone has a cool product, they're probably being paid to say that. So be aware of that. It's and it happens at multiple different levels. One is some influencer you know is just using this thing. Yeah. And sometimes it's the shirt they're wearing, sometimes it's makeup, but often it's a camera and they, they might have in the past disclosed that now they have a relationship with this camera company and this camera company gave them this camera for free. But then a month later, they're still showing and in essence advertising that camera, but they're not continuing to repeat that disclosure. And that's the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission actually requires influencers to mention that it was any gear that was provided for free every single time it shows up. So, but this is the thing, Tony. We had this debate before the podcast started rolling. This is why it makes me nervous to talk about this, because when you get to the root of the problem, it's bias. And someone being paid to talk about a camera could be as biased as someone that just likes a camera brand because their grandpa had it. So <laughs> I know people go into comments and they're like, you were paid by Sony. Like we get that one a lot. And we always disclose like they bring us on the press trips. They've never paid us for anything. But you can't really discern what kind of bias people have. Like, that's really difficult. I know people that have been more biased because they have not been invited on the press trips because then they're mad at whatever camera company and they take it out in the review. And I know people were biased because we are on the press trips because we have people there explaining stuff to us. That's why we tell you that they bring us there so that you can look at our bias and then you can kind of dif differentiate or try to figure out how we're biased. I just think awareness is the most important thing in this. Like you will never know who's sponsored. They should be disclosing it. Some people don't. I think most people do. Most of the, the reviewers that I know personally, they always say if they're sponsored. So I don't think it's like, people are trying to be bad or misleading. I think that the rules of sponsorship are really difficult, and I think it's the manufacturer's fault. I think that if a company, a big camera company, is sponsoring content and they're not making the influencer talk about it, it falls on them because some 18-year-old kid in the Midwest doesn't know all the legalities like a big company does. Yeah, I also think it varies. Like we had somebody that we knew personally told us that a company sent him a piece of gear and required him to make a certain number of positive references about it on online forums and other social media. Yeah. This was many years ago. And they also required him to never mention the fact that he had a contract doing that. Yeah. And I'd, maybe the laws were different at the time, but nowadays that would just be straight up illegal. But that yeah. kind of thing did happen. Like your friend in the forum was talking up a piece of gear, but they that were they required got for free. to say that. Yeah, and we get emails every single day, I'll send you this gear in exchange for a review, or how much is a review? <laughs> we get that one all the time. We're like, we, we can't get paid for a review. That's why we have sponsors like Squarespace, because they don't influence camera reviews, or we do uh, Skillshare, because they don't influence like our review of the gear. But yeah, that just happens in emails straight up. 
How much does your review cost? And you know what tortures me personally is often I'll review a piece of gear and find some problem with it. And I'll alert that problem. And I'll get so many notes from people saying like, well, these other five reviewers didn't mention that. But I sometimes I have known these people and we had talked about it and we all kind of had the same problem, but it didn't crop up. And I don't know why they might leave that out. But I know in one case, the company um, sent the product early and asked me how much the review was. And I said, I'll review the product, but I'm not going to accept payment for it. And I, I think it's safe to assume that at least some of the other reviewers were paid for that early review. And that might be why they left out this particularly fatal flaw. Like it was a, a big flaw that could not have been overlooked. And yet every other reviewer somehow overlooked this particular thing. And it ended up making us look like idiots. Like we were somehow biased against yeah, it because we brought we, up this thing. I mean, we make ourselves look like idiots. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to bring this one up without giving you a solution because I hate the idea of just putting that skepticism there and not giving you any relief on how to deal with it. When I buy something, whether it be my coffee machine or a new lens, uh, I look at multiple different reviews and I consider the source. I did subscribe to Consumer Report. They don't sponsor me at all. I have no, I've never talked to them. I have no relationship with them. I trust them. Um, and I use them to buy a few things like my shower head and stuff like that. But um, yeah, multiple sources, uh, someone that you know discloses their sponsorship. So if they're always saying this is brought to you by Dollar Shave Club or Squarespace or whoever they might have, if they're disclosing it, they probably understand the rules. And most people that I do know are just honest. Like, you don't have to go accusing people. It's not going to help. Uh, but yeah, look for multiple sources. And if there's a if consumer report, I, I use them. Maybe there's another source you trust. Yeah, it's also definitely not cool to accuse people of being sponsored if you don't absolutely have proof of that, because that's just straight up slanderous. You can't just say, oh, you're clearly sponsored by so-and-so company. <laughs> Because that's, that's often not true. Yeah, but my other thing with that is I know people that are sponsored and they're just generally positive anyway. I don't think that that sponsorship really influences how they would talk about that piece of gear. Yeah. Like, they just like stuff. They're always positive. They might be honest. They might honestly yeah. love it anyway. That's yeah. entirely possible. That's my other point. Like, being sponsored doesn't necessarily make you more biased. We really went off on a tangent. This is something that we think about. So those are our other five quote unquote lies that camera manufacturers tell you. If you can think of some more, you can leave them down below in the comments. Uh, thank you Squarespace for making this, this podcast possible. If you'd like to try it out, you can get a 14 day free trial, no credit card needed, so you don't have to remember to cancel. Just go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And if you decide to buy it and you want 10% off, use the coupon code Chelsea. You could also use the coupon code Tony, but I've been discouraging that, okay? <laughs> You're very competitive, Chelsea. I know, for no reason. Okay, see you next time. 